Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Um, it's an uh, exciting day in the sense that uh, we have regularly held safety forums in Australia, but today it's our first time really putting international into the International Airborne Geophysical Safety Association. We'll be holding our annual general meeting here as well. Um, so something we're very pleased with. Uh, thank you all for uh, attending. I know some of you had to extend your stay on the AGC conference, and some of you came special for this uh, forum. Uh, very much appreciated. Uh, we generally get um, outstanding feedback to take the association forward, and uh, we hope very much that you get great value out of the event. You'll see that the uh, safety forum, the material I'm going to present was prepared by Lance Martin, who's our chief operating officer. He would normally be the uh, host of this forum. Sadly, he's uh, not available to attend uh, this time, owing to some unfortunate personal circumstances. So in his absence, uh, the executive committee, you'll see that it will be a bit of a team effort for the executive committee to fill into his uh, able role as best we can. So in terms of the uh, presentation material, a general update on the uh, association where we stand on the 2017 activity data uh, and statistics, um, and most of that material will be presented by uh, uh, Theo Aravanis uh, on the executive committee, who is uh, championed taking the lead in uh, promoting the collection of that material and performing really able analysis. Um, with Joel, Johansson, thank you. Uh, uh, incident and accident review and an opportunity for questions and comments. Um, so the purpose of the safety forum, we've been holding these for uh, several years now. Um, started with them in Canada, expanded it after some time to Australia. We've had a safety forum in South Africa as well in the past. The, the real focus is on sharing information. We want to create an open discussion forum, um, both uh, a very two-way process. Um, the association wants to be able to share with members and prospective members uh, learnings and uh, information developed in the association to promote its use in the industry. Um, but it's two-way, and then the association needs to get feedback from the industry on how they uh, are adapting to the use of material provided by AXA, the challenges they face, and what they would really like to see as initiatives for AXA going forward in terms of uh, the development of material or the analysis of safety information. So there's a great opportunity for communication. You will see in the agenda as Catherine presented, um, we've left a, a large uh, time period open for discussion and we're hopeful that the presentations will uh, stimulate some really useful discussion. And as you see, as we go through some of the material that there is the opportunity now, um, the association and specifically the technical committee have made uh, significant advancements on their initiatives. Um, and there's the opportunity now to uh, consider some new initiatives for them to take forward. Uh, and this is the venue at which we'd like to get feedback from this group uh, to add to that of the general membership and decide where to go. So where do we stand as an association? Uh, we're currently on 68 members. Uh, as you're aware, we have active members who are actively engaged in the uh, collection of airborne geophysical survey data. Uh, and we have associate members who are uh, also involved in that collection, either as providers of services, aviation services, or as client uh, companies or consultants who are involved in the uh, development of survey initiatives and, and the uh, use of the survey data. So all important stakeholders in our industry in ensuring that the industry performs at a high level of safety um, and all uh, interested in promoting the advancement. You'll see we have new members in 2017, uh, four new members. Our membership declined very uh, slightly uh, from 2016, um, but is relatively stable, standing at 68. Uh, I'm very pleased uh, to welcome here uh, our newest member, having uh, joined only in the last day, um, Giles, Giles, excuse me, Richard, uh, with Heliscope who has uh, um, put an application in as an associate member and will be very pleased to welcome them to the association. Uh, the executive committee uh, presently is formed of four, uh, four uh, representatives from active member companies, um, which are the first four listed above. 
um, and two uh, members from associate uh, member companies. Um, you'll see as part of the annual general meeting business um, that some of these members, uh, two of the active members and one of the uh, associate members, am I correct in remembering that, Louis? Is it two or three of the active members? It'll be my Adam an item of interest in the annual general meeting. Some of the members are up for re-election uh, at this annual general meeting uh, forum later today. Um, we can say, or I can say as president, uh, all of the members have been uh, highly engaged and, and involved. And as you'll see through the course of uh, the later material, we have had a high attendance and um, involvement of these members. IAXA has participated in 2017 uh, in these uh, particular meetings and conferences, uh, most notably the uh, Safety Forum in Toronto in March, um, where the AGM was held, as it has been done in prior years, um, with a high level of uh, attendance and participation. Uh, a Safety Forum in Cape Town, uh, as mentioned, we want to uh, make sure that the Safety Forums travel uh, to the uh, areas of the business uh, because we have to be cognizant of the fact that uh, some of the people who would attend the safety forums aren't necessarily the same uh, people who attend the key industry conferences which we tend to put uh, the safety forums at. So we're trying to make sure that they move to uh, other geographic areas so we can capture as much uh, feedback and input as possible. Uh, there was attendance of the IAXA at the Exploration 2017 conference. Um, as in some prior years, uh, we have attended OGP events to ensure that IAGSA um, concerns are addressed and that we're getting feedback from OGP. Um, this, uh, in this year, it was attended by Greg McComb, a uh, member of the Technical Committee. The Executive Committee had uh, five meetings by teleconference, um, and there were six Technical Committee uh, teleconference. And you'll see through the course of the material the advancements that have been made through the course of these meetings and events. So in terms of uh, developments in this last year and advancements, um, one of the more significant items is uh, we updated and released our uh, safety manual with the important inclusion of uh, SMS material. Um, this had been uh, identified as a gap, uh, as most of us are aware. Um, current safety practice is uh, and culture I identify as very uh, as a forward item as having a, a culture based on a safety management system in aviation and it was identified IAXA uh, while we had a lot of prescriptive items in our manual this was a notable omission which we felt needed to be addressed um, it was a challenge in terms of the technical committee taking this on in that uh, our membership is quite diverse in terms of the size and complexity of the organizations from some very large airborne operators uh, to very small airborne operators and we had to find uh, the right balance in terms of having uh, guidance for a safety management system implementation that could be appropriate through the spectrum. I think we've, uh, I think we've achieved that well in that providing a simple framework that can be implemented. Um, so that was issued in this last year. A key focus this year going forward will be to support the members in uh, putting this in place. Uh, we've identified a goal at which all members are required to be working towards the implementation of SMS through 2018. Um, and IAXA is uh, going to take a, a forward proactive approach in supporting this uh, implementation. Another uh, key item that was advanced in 2017 was the development of a self-assessment audit program. Um, in past, IAGSA has been on a, a schedule at which members, active members, were audited um, over a course of a certain period. Uh, it had been three years previously. Um, and while those audits uh, we felt had great value, um, the gap in time uh, meant that there was not enough sufficient information. Uh, being provided back and forth, and we felt that there could be great value in having a self-assessment done by members such that it would increase their awareness of the actual uh, IAGSA standards and guidelines that are in place uh, through an annual refresher. Um, and by having this material put on our website, it would provide greater transparency to the industry to help advance uh, safety culture, safety initiatives, and give much better value to our associate members who can use this material to help them see where 
uh, the industry is at and members are at in their safety uh, implementation. Um, we hope, uh, you know, we're taking the approach that transparency is the greatest uh, way at which to advance uh, the overall industry and the overall culture. So this program was put in place in 2017 um, and it was at the end of 2017 that the expectation would be that all members would have performed a self-assessment we would post it. Uh, as a very new program, it's not entirely uh, surprising that uh, we haven't had an instant uh, uptake on that, uh, but it is an area that will take, uh, require some attention early in 2018. We have at this, as of this date, eight uh, of 27 active members uh, have submitted their self-assessments for 2017 and these have been posted on the website. There are some others that are in process and will shortly uh, be posted, but of course we'd like to move that as quickly as possible to 100% uh, compliance basis and uh, IAGS, uh, notably the Chief Operating Officer Lance Martin will be supporting uh, our active members in doing so. A key point that must be made, uh, one of the uh, goals with this process was that uh, we wanted to be make more transparency on the notice of difference areas where members basically identify IAGSA uh, guidelines or standards that they are not adopting and provide a notice of difference with the risk assessment identifying why uh, their decision not to adopt such standards uh, it has been considered as uh, safety appropriate. The big reason for this is uh, twofold. One, to uh, give transparency to the industry as to what standards are being adopted by uh, each member company, which has great value to our associate members. Importantly for AGSA as well, uh, we have to have that feedback loop to know where our standards and guidelines perhaps are not appropriate. Um, and if we're learning that a lot of members are, are not adopting um, particular standards, but with risk assessment they're showing good reasons why not, um, then IAXA can be uh, learning from this and adapting our standards uh, more appropriately. Where in past, not getting this feedback, uh, we had the worry that members might take the approach that uh, not all IAXA standards or guidelines really make sense for them, and it could degrade the overall value uh, of the process. So we will be putting uh, great attention on moving those forward. The notices of differences are posted uh, along with the self-assessment uh, audits on the website. Uh, to give all uh, transparency and the risk assessments help all of us to uh, identify where we can um, mitigate uh, the risks associated with standards and, and hopefully advance, uh, advance safety uh, awareness through the industry. 2017, um, sadly we did have uh, within our industry and with a, a member company of AXA one fatal accident in 2017. Uh, in Canada, and that will be uh, uh, discussed in a bit more detail, detail later on. Um, we had zero non-fatal accidents uh, in 2017. We continue to struggle as an industry to report incidents to IAXA. This is an area in which, uh, as an executive committee, we've been uh, promoting very hard to get uh, awareness in this regard. We had 15 incidents reported uh, from nine member companies uh, through 2017. Um, on a statistical basis, it's notable to note that year on year, it's the same member companies uh, typically reporting incidents, um, which does suggest, of course, on a statistical basis that other member companies are not reporting incidents that are likely happening. Um, this is a process, uh, safety culture uh, is one of reporting to learn from incidents, um, and it's a sign of an advanced safety culture when incidents are being reported. Uh, and so we do see it as a concern um, that the industry is not moving as fast as we'd like in this regard. Uh, and certainly uh, this forum is one where we want to create an open opportunity for people to talk about incidents and learn from incidents. Uh, and we're going to be continuing to encourage through the industry that uh, people do bring these forward for us. With that point, in terms of uh, sharing uh, the duties that Lance would ably perform, I'm going to hand over to uh, Theo Aravanis to take the rest of the presentation forward, please. It's fairly self-explanatory, but a um, you know, number of members. There was a little bit of a discrepancy on the previous slide, 27. There's one active member that's very non-active, and so I think Lance is considering them as not a member now. 
I think they paid their dues or whatever, but they're not doing anything. So anyway, so in the past, you can see that um, in the hot colours is the total number of um, uh, of our members, and in the past, or from 2011, we started the uh, the audit program. Not all members, only about a third, were audited in a particular year, and so the the hotter colour is indicating how many were audited. Um, no one was audited last year, but uh, in 2017, uh, everyone should have, as, um, as Greg indicated, everyone should have put in their um, their self um, self auditing stats. So from next year. Everyone needs, so the colours will change next year, but we, we are tracking this, all right? Um, you know, uh, Joel and I, uh, being associate members, you know, well, look, I'll speak for myself. I, I reckon part of my job is to hold the, you know, the active members' feet to the fire to make sure that they're not using IAGS or logo and thinking that's job done. Now, your presence here would indicate you are not it. You know, you, you, this is not the target audience I, I want to talk to. Um, but we've got to get the message out that uh, IAXA is more than just paying your dues. Um, yeah, so 97%, so 27 out of 28 people reported their hours, and that's great. Thank you very much. Uh, Lance shows this chart, chart and uh, when was it? 2013 was our banner year. No fatalities, no accidents, no injuries. We all said at the time that that was, that was great, but it was probably unrealistic to expect that to con you know, continue and proof you know, has shown, right? So we'll continue to keep looking at these things, right, uh, in conjunction with everything else, and just, as Greg said, to see where the technical committee needs to focus. We'll talk about that fatal accident towards the end. Um, oh, I'm not going to really go through that, but Lance monitors this, and he, for uh, for reasons, I'm not. He applies a three-year rolling average, uh, normalised over 100,000 hours, and um, he just to reiterate, he's the only one that knows the hours. The executive does not know the hours. He just gives us a number, right? Okay, so um, as you probably guessed by now, I'm a, an Excel nerd. Um, so I track these things, and so it's up the top in the hot colour is the percentage of uh, member helicopter hours versus uh, fixed wing hours. You can see it's staying around about two thirds, one third. Um, it's good to see that you know you saw it here first. That the the um, we are on the new super cycle, which I'm sure as active members you'd be bloody happy to hear that you you know on average you're flying 50% more hours. Um, that's good, all right. And we'll continue to track those that um, we're still way down on our Halcyon days of 2011. But this is good. Okay, so now this is the one that worries me, and it's worried me for a while. And you know, um, people that look at these charts, it's the um, again, this is a three-year rolling average of um, the fatal fixed-wing accidents, and you can see that they're creeping up. And uh, what was worrying was that hours were going down. These are fixed-wing hours, right? Previously, it was total hours. This is just fixed wing hours. This is a concern, right, guys? Um, the comparable one for rotary is there. Yes, the hours are out, but um, the trend is our friend here. Right? This is a trend that we'd like to keep. Right, so this is putting it all together in the previous years. So total accidents in red, fixed wing fatal in orange, helicopter and green and a combined total. So what I'd like to do is then put that, well, here's our incident reporting and I've got to tell you I'm a, a little bit bummed that we got 15, I was a, 
I was even more bummed when I came back from holidays, I think at the end of January, to see there was only seven. Rio Tinto, two of those incidents Rio Tinto knows about, and they were both bloody good news stories. And, <laughs> it, you know, we should be... We've gone to great lengths. Lance has gone to great lengths to make sure there's no... All these things are uh, de-identified. We should be putting them in there, and it's and it's. It, I reckon it belies the the culture of the the association if Lance has to go and chase these things up. Right. Thank you very much. And it's, yes, it'll be probably the nine companies or some of the uh, the nine companies that uh, are sitting here that are reported. We've got to get people out there. Reporting more, you know, and it's great. You know, I mean, looking at the gross trend pre 2011, we were we were reporting fatalities because we had to. And I'm saying we as a as a group here, right? You know, and then the serious accidents. We've 2011, we raised the bar. What constitutes a reportable incident? And it's great, and I'm positive that there's more out there, guys. So putting those two charts together, you know, the fixed wing fatal go is creeping up, reporting going down. Okay, enough said on that. Okay, <clears throat> so on the uh, left-hand side, we've got all the incidents from 2001 to 17, and then on the right-hand side. So, um, things to see. Uh, well, bird strikes, we're keeping a historical average, right? And this is one that concerns me, right? Fuel, I, fuel has made a big, um, big impact, and they weren't in one geographical region, they were spread across the globe, but I don't think that there was a... Um, great cont fuel contamination crisis in 2017. I just think that more members are, are reporting it, and that's great. But these are the things that we need to know, right? You know, and so we can... So the technical committee, we can direct them to work on, you know, where their efforts are needed. You know, we need to prioritise their time. Um, towed sensors. Yeah. Well, you can read the chart there yourselves, right? And you can see that um, there are some things that are that are needing attention. They're historical. Some are just artefacts of better reporting. All right, accidents. So, two thousand one, you can see there's been fifty accidents. Half of them have been fatal, and we've lost fifty three lives. Sorry, yeah. Um, Greg, I've got it on my spreadsheet. I'll have to see, but I, I've, I've, Lance does the classification, not me. Okay, so I'll, we can pull that out on uh, on the break. Okay, but yeah, you know, all this information in its raw form is on the IAXA website, and I just pull it down for Rio Tinto purposes. But I see there's no competitive advantage here. I'm quite happy to share that spreadsheet with you guys. Right. Okay, so um, what can I say? You know, we um, it was really, really um, annoying. Maybe that's not the right word, but to to have that um, accident in um, in uh, Canada this last year. Anyway. You notice a big chunk up there, still unknown, and we'll never know. Lance has done his best to dig through the archives, um, but let's call them the bad old days. It was very little was given away. You just gave it, well, not you, but I'm just saying that it was, um, it's very hard to decipher what happened. Okay. Now, this is a personal bugbear, and this is something for Rio Tinto, and I'm sorry if I'm going to offend anyone, and I'm sorry if I'm going to labour the point, but um, 
we know that um, certain type of aircraft are cheaper than others to operate and run. And we submit tenders. This is Rio. I'm wearing my Rio Tinto hat here. Um, submit tenders out there, and sometimes there's a big delta in the price. And the project manager goes, cheap one, thanks. And so we've got to pull in this chart every couple of years. All right. And I've updated it, right? The stats speak themselves, right? So um, single and, uh, and uh, twin piston, right? And then you've got your turbines there, as Lance has got there. Now, there might be some debate about some of the older ones, but you know, if, if one or more, if one or two of the older ones are being misclassified, it's not really going to change that, that, the, the message from that chart. Uh, I'm not saying that Rio Tinto's got an open checkbook, right? So don't, because Mike's over there looking at me staring daggers, right? But we are prepared, prepared to pay for safety, and if it means that we fly a more expensive aircraft, if it means that we have to have two pilots on the job instead of one, we will. Okay, uh, so that was, sorry, that was fatal accidents. This is non-fatal accidents. I think you can make your own story, what happens there, and the, um, we've had many discussions about the um, single versus uh, twin piston, all right, we, at the last uh, meeting we had a great discussion about that, I believe. So, putting it all together. Injuries, so not, I believe that that's fatalities and injuries. This is something that uh, I, I'm not too sure it means too much. Fly in Europe, I reckon. <laughs> um, but it's just okay. Um, uh, Lance would have been the best one to talk about this, but uh, in April we got the sad news of the um, of the Navajo going down in um, in Canada, and uh, it, I'm sure everyone's head was scratching. You know, hit power line six kilometres out from the airport. What the hell were they doing six kilometres? You know, the, the big power lines, the hydro lines, right? What the hell were they doing? Um, at the time, just for my purposes, I went on there and checked the time of day that the accident happened. There wasn't loss of light. Uh, checked the weather. It was it was cold, right? But it wasn't, um, you know. Weather didn't appear to be a factor, light didn't appear to be a factor, and I'm scratching my head going, what the hell is going on here? Um, well, uh, I'm not too sure why Lance hasn't got it in here, and maybe I shouldn't, but I will. Turns out the two pilots were jerking around. The survey area was 85 kilometres from, from the airport, it's a big survey, two aircraft, they'd been on it for a month. And it seemed for some, a period of time, the two pilots, two young blokes, were just hooning up and down the valleys all the way back to Shefferville. They gambled, they lost. Stupid accident. Um, my colleague Mike will uh, will give our experience about low level flying transit because I, I got to tell you this one was a real eye opener for me but Mike was already on this one. Um, we go to great detail with the risk assessment on the survey area, but then you know from the airport to the survey area we've just we've always said pilots business, secret pilots business. We don't you know and, and the the you know, guidelines say that. There's got to be a transit altitude, but we've not paid much attention to it. Um, well, Mike's been doing it for a while, and I'll tell you, within Rio Tinto, we, this has got our attention, and we, we monitor this, as you will see with, with Mike. 
Right. So um, these, these are Lance's comments here. So this accident was very preventable. Um, I'll cut to the chase. I believe in your guidelines, our guidelines, it says the chief pilot, he or she, must be monitoring flight performance. So um, I asked the question, how can the... They now know this after the fact because they've monitored all the, the GPS tracking of the, 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 the aircraft and those pilots. This has been going on for a month, right? You know, how could that possibly happen that, you know, our guidelines say that the chief pilot monitors this. I'm not saying it's got to be monitored daily, but for goodness sake, a month, right? You know, you've got to, I don't know how, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars worth of assets, and you don't care what's happening to it? Again, I know I'm probably preaching to the converted here in this, this audience over here. Um, so... Uh, Rio Tinto and I believe Anglo. Uh, uh, um, we monitor this now, right? And it's and it's um, we put it on the uh, active, sorry, the associate members that they should be monitoring monitoring um, flight performance as well, including transit. I'm not too sure what else he says here. There's. There's the second last point, I'm not too sure I know enough about it. Um, Greg, do you know? Uh, it, it appears, if I read between the lines, that the company involved had subcontracted and therefore somehow thought that their responsibility had... Yeah. It doesn't happen. Anyway, uh, that, was, that was it. 